You need to know this is a case where you can have a neutral oxygen as a leaving group. Let's see why. Um, do you think this ring is happy or unhappy? Unhappy. Why? Strange. Strange. That's right. <laughs> you guys ever um, actually tried to make a model of these? Yes, I don't know. it's very hard. Yeah, in fact, when I do it, I always break the little pegs in the holes. It's very frustrating. Okay, this is extremely strained. So, does this ring want to open or not want to open? Want to open. It's, and that's what happened here. It's so eager to open that it's willing to do that with a bad leaving group. So even when there's an exception, we should be able to understand why we have that exception. So this is a case where we can have an, a bad leaving group as the O minus to get rid of the strain. But the general rule still holds. In most cases, you can't have a neutral oxygen as a leaving group. And we ended up protonating this. All right, by the way, this is another way to form carbon-carbon bonds. Oh, yeah. we formed, all right, so now we have two ways to form carbon-carbon bonds. That makes our life tougher when we're doing first synthesis. Was E1 or E2 and then the second one's greener? Uh, let's see. Well, no, actually, let's, let's review that. What are the two ways to form carbon-carbon bonds? One way is when a Grignard attacks an epoxide. And what's the other way to form carbon-carbon bonds? Grignard attacks a carbon... Sure. partially paused. Oh, a carbonyl? A carbonyl. It's, it's, That's it's, right. Both ways are on the board. Don't you get another carbon-carbon bond in E2 or E1? Because oh, you get, the you get a pi bond. That's right. I wasn't right. thinking of that. Oh. All right. That's right. So I should be saying... Uh, you got me. All right, so um, that's right. That's a way to form a carbon-carbon pi bond. Um, what we're talking about then is we should say ways to form carbon-carbon sigma bonds. Okay. We only um, have two ways to form carbon-carbon carbon sigma bonds. Um, a Grignard attacking a carbonyl and a Grignard That's what we have here. Uh, or, well, I guess I should what call it oxacyclopropane, whatever your instructor okay. calls it. There's lots of different names for this. Some people call it an epoxide. Some people call it oxacyclopropane. Um, epoxide is better because it's shorter. Carbon bonds, sigma. Yeah, but it's by green unit attacking a or green attacking oxycyclopropane. You can see that's what happened here, right? We did form a new carbon carbon sigma bond. Now, so this is important when you're doing synthesis. If you see that the product has more carbon carbon sigma bonds than the starting material, you know there's only two ways to do it. You, for one thing, you know you're going to use a Grignard. And the only question is should it be a Grignard in a carbonyl or a Grignard in an epoxide? Whichever one is going to work better. When should you use an epoxide? Um, when you want to add two carbons and an oxygen, right? If you want to add two carbons and an oxygen, this is the way to go. Uh, I guess things are a little more complicated than that, because that, there could be substituents on the number three and the number four. Uh, it's this, it's this ring. This is oxycyclopropane. It's also called an epoxide. All right, maybe we shouldn't get into that uh, too much here. But uh, you guys have covered so much material, I keep having to give you new handouts. So That's a good thing. <laughs> So. No, there's much more to learn. I, is there one? Yeah, there is. Can you mean, isn't there? And I won't need to look at lecture 19 and 20 and see if there's any more appreciation. Uh, we haven't gone over, well, some of the stuff on here we haven't gone over yet. But uh, So here's an overview of the things that you can do with R minus, right? Where do you get R minus from? Yeah, R minus means a carbon with a negative charge, right? So this is what you can basically do with that. So you can see at the top, um, what do Grignards do? Grignards attack carbonyls or epoxides, right? A Grignard can attack a uh, carbonyl or a uh, epoxide. That's on the left. Alkyl lithiums can do the same thing, attack a carbonyl or an epoxide. But what can they do on the right? So the other thing that the Grignards can do is deprotonate oxygens, nitrogens, and sulfurs. Depro deprotonate electronegative atoms. We really have all three of those on the board, right? We've shown the three things we can do with a Grignard. Uh, so first of all, a Grignard can deprotonate a oxygen, nitrogen, or sulfur. A Grignard is good at deprotonating things. That's why we have to keep it away from protic solvents, remember. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing you can do with a Grignard. Usually this is not what you want to do with a Grignard. Uh, this is what you want to avoid doing. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so that's what we have. Uh, so we're looking at the box at the top of page one of the handout. So if you look at the right-hand side, it says that a Grignard can deprotonate an OH, NH, or SH. So that's an example of that here. That's one thing a Grignard can do. And then on the left-hand side, we have things acting like nucleophiles. So the Grignard can attack an epoxide or a carbonyl. I drew little cartoons of those. Well, those are these two reactions over here. So those are the other things that a Grignard um, can do uh, over here. Notice that when you do that, it's always two steps. You add the carbonyl, and then you have to add the water separately to protonate. Or you add the epoxide, and then you have to add the water separately to protonate. 
Okay, um, we won't go over every single detail. Here, but. Okay, well, that's uh, so uh, we won't talk about everything on this handout, but we kind of covered the top. Notice that it also shows that you can do the same two things with alkylithiums. Alkylithiums can deprotonate things on the right or attack carbonyls or epoxides. Uh, we didn't talk too much about lithium aluminum hydride today, but uh, that's kind of similar. That's a source of H minus. We talked about that last time. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And NADH4, right? Are both H Those are both basically are sources H of H minus. We should practice those. Okay. Okay. Well, um, so I think, uh, so we went over some important reactions. So basically the big thing for today, we went over a bunch of different things, but one big thing was that we went over grid yards. So these are the things you can do with grid yards. Um, and uh, now you have those in your arsenal for synthesis. So these three things on the board are the things grid yards can do. They can attack, uh, deprotonate things. They don't deprotonate carbons. They deprotonate electronegative atoms. Or they can attack carbonyls or uh, epoxides. Uh, and the other thing we did is uh, we did our first synthesis problems today. And I kind of tried to introduce some techniques for synthesis. Um, and most people find it very difficult to remember to use those techniques because they've never done this in any other class before. So what are the techniques? So one technique is try to find atoms in the starting material that you know are the same as the atoms in the product and give them the same number. Um, look for landmarks. Uh, of course, if you can't do that, you give up, but try hard to find some carbons that correspond to the other carbons. And also, don't just work from left to right. Try to also work from right to left, and try to get the two sides to meet up in the middle. Very often, the problem actually is much better, do more, more doable if you're working from, working from right to left. Um, so when you're setting this up on a piece of paper, try to put the starting material on the far left, and try to put the product on the far right, so you have plenty of room for them to meet each other in the middle. I only have a, I don't have that much room on the board here because of the camera. But if I was, if I was doing this for real, I would put the product over here, and I'd put the starting material all the way over here, so I'd have plenty of room between them for lots of reactions to happen between them. So when you're using your piece of paper, I would even turn the piece of paper horizontally like this. And I would put the starting material here and the product down here, and then there would be lots of room for things first to move forward from the pro starting material or backwards from the product over here. All these little things can actually make a big difference. And also, um, don't get discouraged if you think synthesis is tough. It's supposed to be tough. It's a tough kind of puzzle doing, and you can only get better with practice. It's not supposed to be obvious what the answer is until, until you've worked at it for a while. OK? All right, so my last advice would be, uh, so you guys keep asking me what are the important reactions, but I'm kind of punting on that. Again, the best thing is to ask the TAs or the instructor. Um, however, uh, again, I really believe in this idea of finding these multi-part problems at the end of the chapter that cover many different variations of the same idea and carefully studying this, the um, solutions guide for that. That's the best way to really build, um, build a basic understanding. You guys were mentioning looking at the chapter integration problems. That's great. But again, those are hard. Um, you won't learn much from those unless you understand the basic reactions. And the way to understand the basic reactions is to do a multi-part problem uh, like A through K that has many different variations uh, on the same idea. So you should certainly try to find some Grignard uh, problems because that was one of the main things that we focused on today. I forget what else we went over, but anything else we went over, you want to try to find problems that are kind of variations uh, on that. And um, certainly I would recommend doing the uh, sample exam. Uh, yeah, this from your instructor, even if there's going to be, even, yeah. if there's, even if there's going to be stuff on the exam that isn't on the sample exam, you can kind of expect the stuff that is on the sample exam is yeah. going to be important. Um, this is a class with a pretty lenient curve. Usually, the, the average is pretty low in this class. You don't need to get everything right to get a decent grade. You've got to get some things right. So sometimes people mess themselves up by trying to learn a little bit of everything. And if you learn a little bit of everything, you don't know enough to get really any of the questions right, basically. That so maybe it's more important, more important to make sure that you really know the stuff you've already covered, the stuff we talked about in the tutoring and the basic reactions, and make sure you can get those points. True. Okay. Oh, thanks. These videos are offered on a pay what you like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. Uh, there's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos.htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype, and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website.